Good evening, folks. This is Terry Power from Family Law Reform. We're going to get started in just about two minutes. We have uh, a lot of folks uh, jumping on the webcast right now. We want to give them an opportunity to hear the whole thing completely. So uh, be patient with us. We'll be getting started in just about a minute or so. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Terry Power with Family Law Reform. Appreciate you taking some time out of your evening to uh, spend with us to update you on what's going on in Tallahassee. I would like to welcome the hundreds of attendees from actually all over the country that are on this webinar. We will be here between 60 and 90 minutes, depending on questions. Uh, it's important that everybody understand that nothing being presented uh, this evening should be considered as being legal advice. If you have specific questions about your own case, your own situation, you should consult with a qualified attorney. So with that, uh, with that being said, we will have opportunities for, uh, for questions of a general, general nature and also to give you opportunities to find out a bit more about the exciting news going on out of Tallahassee this year. The participants in this evening's webcast will be Alan Frischer, who is the co-founder of Family Law Reform. Uh, myself, uh, I'm the legislative strategist for family law reform and mostly known as the guy that sits next to Alan at the committee meetings. And also Lori Barkas. Lori uh, is a family law attorney out of Weston, Florida, who's been, as well as a couple other uh, uh, family law attorneys, just a huge supporter of reforming some of these outdated laws. Your host this evening, and again, is uh, Alan Frischer. Alan is a financial advisor out of Melbourne, Florida. He's a certified divorce financial analyst, an author, and also the co-director and spokesman for Family Law Reform. Alan's email address is on the screen, and uh, it'll also be up, uh, contact information will be up for him also at the end of this webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and will be available for viewing on the Family Law Reform website uh, probably sometime tomorrow. So if you have um, associates or friends that missed the call, missed the webinar, they can go back in at a later time, view it at their own pleasure. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Alan Frischer. Well, welcome everybody to the, to the webinar. Thank you very much, Terry. Great job. And uh, I guess you are the eye candy with the Tallahassee. Thank you. With you. Good bet. <laughs> um, I'd like to personally thank everyone for putting their trust and faith in me to help lead the effort you know, toward reform. And um, I want to thank you, everyone, for all of your efforts for all of these years, um, especially my, my co-founder, Chuck Weinerston, um, our executive committee, as well as all of the other family law attorneys who've been supportive in reforming our law over the years, and really who have helped guide us um, with all the legality surrounding this proposed law. It's, it's not easy to understand the law. If it were, everybody would be lawyers, I guess. Um, I want to also take a moment to acknowledge Dick Lindsay, uh, the founder of the Alliance for Alimony Reform. Dick basically raised his five daughters while while still paying permanent alimony to his ex-wife. I always referred to Dick as the grandfather of alimony reform here in Florida. He would come to Tallahassee and uh, be at the legislative meetings. Dick recently passed away. And while he didn't get to witness the, the end of permanent alimony in our state, he, uh, he is finally at peace and looking down with some smiling on this one. And uh, uh, I know that, you know, he's, he's in a better place right now. Okay, that said, 
Um, I am on speakerphone right now. Sometimes I may go in and out. Um, again, ask questions. If you can't hear me, make sure you, you type in a question. Terry will be able to relay that to me. Um, there's going to be a lot of information being given. And um, I think I want to start the, the webinar by just telling a, uh, a little children's joke that's going to be very important to you for you to remember as we go along. How do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. The elephant I'm talking about is changing current family law here in Florida and especially how it relates to alimony. Um, changing law in Florida really has been a huge under very, very challenging. It doesn't happen. It happens one bite at a time, one step at a time, intermittently as we go along. We I remember um, Senator Sachs. She was in West Palm. We had a, a, a kind of a little indeed, seminar summit out there, and she came and spoke to many of our members, and she said it probably shouldn't be fast, referring to changing law. It should happen incrementally. It should happen slowly because it's affecting so many people. And certainly we've found that out over the years. Um, it takes patience, it takes time, it takes determination, and it also takes a strategy. Our strategy all along has been very, very simply to educate our legislators, to develop our credibility, and show them what's happening. Show them with the, the anecdotal horror stories that we have, show them by educating them with the media, show them by explaining what the problems are, having our constituents come out and talk with them, but educate them, educate them, educate them, and then allow them to change the law with us in helping, you know, having us influence them along the way. It's a process, if I guess is what I'm getting at here, and it's, and it's just not easy. So what I'd like to do is manage everybody's expectations on this webinar as we as we progress through all of this. Because like I said, there's a lot to cover in a very short amount of time. I want everybody to please understand that no law is perfect. No law is going to beneficially affect everybody out there. It's just impossible. And and it can't. But that doesn't mean we stop trying to get as much as we can and that doesn't mean we, we give up or we accept you know what we have now. We do the best that we can, and then we come back and do more and more in future years. That's the way the law runs, and that's just the way everybody has to understand it. And that's exactly really what we're doing and what we have done these past five years. I'm not going to get into specifics on anyone's individual alimony situation, and I'm not going to go over every page of the committee substitute bill. That would just be um, too difficult, and that's not really what we're looking to do here tonight. I'm going to give an overview of our proposed bill and recognizing that it really is just that, a proposed bill, not the law yet. Everybody needs to understand that. The governor, as you well know, still must sign this into law. And it still has to go through two, possibly more, more committees. Um, during those stops, it will have amendments. It will have changes. And um, we're still actively in negotiations right now. As a matter of fact, through this morning, I was in negotiations with leaders of the family section of the Florida Bar through our lobbyists and through our sponsors and with our sponsors, um, certainly input, and they're the ones that ultimately make the decisions. So I'm going to touch upon a lot of key issues during this during this webinar. I may not get to everything. I may touch upon your specific key issue, but again, there's going to be other times. Um, we'll have another webinar after the law is signed, the proposal is signed into law. And uh, we'll be able to answer you know, other questions at that point with any luck. Um, please remember that when it comes to negotiations going on, the negotiations have to do with all the stakeholders. And when I talk about the stakeholders, you, our member, are certainly an important stakeholder. We do indeed have influence with what our legislators are looking to do in changing the law. But they are the ones that change the law ultimately. They create the law, they make the law. The family section of the Florida Bar also is a stakeholder. They absolutely you know, write the law 
understand what has to be done, and they are responsible for affecting every citizen, not just the alimony payers, not just the alimony receivers, but everybody involved now, currently, and in the future. So they have a very big responsibility. And whether or not you know you, you like family lawyers, whether or not you like the judicial system in general, they are there to stay, will be there to stay. And we have to try to work with them and compromise and come to a, a balanced type of, of proposal and legislative relief. And that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants compromise for all of the stakeholders involved. And you know, ultimately what we want and what we expect is what's correct for our citizens now and in the future. So we're, we're looking at what the point when I told you it's, it's complicated and it's a process. Believe me, you know, that's really what it is. Um, on another note, just know that this is live. I might make mistakes in how I phrase certain things. Um, I know we have attorneys out there who are listening. Forgive me. You understand my intent, even if that's not exactly what I say or how I say it. Luckily, if I get to it, Lori Marcus will, will chime in and give me the, the legal views and tell me that I'm wrong or I'm, I'm, I'm misquoting it or misstating it. So I have people helping me out there. So please forgive me if I, if I do that all along. Um, that said, let's get on to the, um, the first slide because we're going to talk about the Tallahassee update and what we can do to help later on. Let's get to the first slide, Terry. Okay. All right, what we're seeking in 2015. Now, this slide is, is interesting because if some of you have come up to Tallahassee, you've seen me walking around with a big binder and um, a legislative session information packet. We put this packet together every year for like five years. This is the 2015 version. And these five or six key points are exactly what we have in the legislative session information packet. These key points have gotten directly to our legislators, have gotten directly to the family section of leaders of the family section of the Florida Bar, and these really have been and always will be our key regarding alimony. Are they the only issues? Absolutely not. There are many more issues that we've discussed over the years that we're, we have worked on and have been included in this proposal. So I'm very, very pleased that many of this, much of this has been addressed and effectively addressed, I might add also, with what we have as a proposal now. So let's, without further ado, let's start talking about some of the, the key issues and the key parts of this new proposal. Number one, the removal of permanent alimony from the current Florida statute. How huge is that if we can get that? And ladies and gentlemen, that is what we have in this new proposal. The removal of permanent alimony. Now that doesn't mean the removal of alimony. It would mean the removal of permanent alimony. People, after this law goes into effect, will not have to pay alimony permanently for the rest of their lives. There will be an end date to alimony. In the proposal, the alimony length will be a range that the judge will have from 25% to 75% length of the marriage. Now, when I give this range, you have to also understand that there will be, must be, and will always be judicial discretion. I know it's a uh, dirty word, a couple of dirty words to some of you, but this is how our society must run. There must be control in our society. There must be somebody at the, at the top that makes those tough decisions. And we have to either elect them, appoint them, and believe that those people are going to make the fair decisions for people down the line. Um, whether or not you've been emotionally victimized in the courts, I know many of us have been, but a lot of it is because the laws enabled that to occur and there were no guidelines for judges surrounding alimony. Now what we have are guidelines. And that's really what they are. They are guidelines. Which means that judges can go outside of the guidelines. But, and this is a big but, they 
would have to write down the reason why they're doing it and ultimately create new case laws surrounding this. So this is this is huge, everybody. This is something that has never been in Florida statutes. These arrangements is unique to Florida right now. And ultimately, because the high end of it goes at 75 percent the length of the marriage, it means there's an end date to the alimony, certainly for new cases down the line. For current cases, there are other ways to end alimony in addition to this durational um, ending. And we'll get into that as we go a little bit further. Um, Lori, do you have anything more you want to say on, on this part of it while I have you? Can we take a little sip of water? Not, not at this time, Alan. Let's 
so spurred on. Terry, let's go to number three. A defined amount based on a formula that's fair and averages income to both spouses. This is one of the key components of this new proposed legislation. And, okay, I want everybody to realize that we're not eliminating alimony. And the stakeholders here, I'm talking about the receivers, I'm talking about the payers, I'm talking about the legislators, I'm talking about the family section, I'm talking about the members. We have gone through so many different scenarios of just having a certain number of years of alimony, having an exact number, an exact amount of alimony, you're not going to be able to please everybody. In addition, we have to allow for judicial discretion on the amounts. So what we've done is we've come up with a, a formula that allows for an alimony award to have a range as well. And I'm not going to get into the specifics of the formula, but I will tell you that, well, maybe I will get into the specifics a little bit. I think everybody deserves to know a little bit. And for those analytical people out there, you need to understand kind of what would be happening here. The first part of the formula is a multiplier. And on line 210 of the committee substitute, it says 0.0125. That is no longer the multiplier that we had agreed on. And there was reasons why we increased that multiplier to 0.015. That's going to be the new multiplier for the low end of the alimony award. Um, for an alimony award, judges have to understand, again, a guideline. So we've given them a low end and a high end. Again, for your analytics out there, if, and again, I'm just throwing out either the man or the woman, it doesn't matter, one spouse is making 130000 and the other spouse is making 30000 The way that this multiplier works is you take the difference in the amount. So in this case, it would be 100000 And I, again, purposely made these numbers easy so that people can follow along. So if we have the difference of 100000 let's use that standard across the board right now. The multiplier on the low end would be for the number of years married, times the multiplier, times um, either 1.015 or 0.02 on the high end. And that would give you your ranges for the alimony up to 20 years. So everything is going to be the amount of years that you are married times 0.015 on the low end, times that difference in amount, so the 100,000, times the number of years you were married, times 0.015 on the low end, or times 0.02 on the high end. That is the range, the percent range, that the judges would have. So for, let's say, a five-year marriage, the range would be 7.5% to 10% of the difference of the amounts. That's what it comes down to. And again, you'll see a bar graph later on. I'm not going to get into the specifics of all that now. Somewhere after the bill is, is um, assigned, we will get out the graph so everybody can see these numbers, but just trust me that this is the way it works right now. For a 10-year marriage, it would be 15 to 20%. For a 15-year marriage, it would be 22.5 to 30%. For a 20-year marriage, it would be a 30 to 40%. For a 25-year marriage or higher, it would be 30 to 40% as well because at 20 years, there is a, a break. Nothing goes beyond 20 years unless, unless the judge decides that they are going to order alimony to be paid for less than half the length of the marriage. So assuming you were married, let's say, 25 years, and the judge orders you to pay alimony for 10 years because you may be getting close to retirement, and again, that would be a substantial change, the judge can order you, all well, according to the formula, the judge can order you to pay for, let's say, 10 years, and according to the formula, you would have to pay, the multiplier would be for 25 years at the high end. And the range would be between 30% and 50% of that difference number. Again, there's a range. It doesn't mean you'd be paying $50,000 on that difference of 
thousand. So if you're making one hundred and thirty thousand, you would pay her. You would have to pay fifty thousand a year. Okay. There's a range. You could potentially pay thirty thousand a year as well. Depends upon what the judge decides. And again, I'll have a chart that shows all these numbers, and you can do the multiplication for yourself. But trust me, that this is the way it comes out. The bottom line is that there is a range of amounts on a low end and a high end. And there is a duration now that ultimately ends your alimony. We tried to make it so that all the stakeholders in here, it works for the alimony payers who have been married a long time, who may be depending, the receivers may be depending on some of this money, but they also realize that in time, alimony will end. So they may be justified in getting a little bit more money for a shorter duration before retirement hits. And Really and truly, they would be. For short-term marriages, we agreed to make this number a little bit higher from 0.0125 to 0.015, but the numbers are really fairly low because it's short-term marriages. And again, the, the duration would be for, let's say, a five-year marriage, you're talking uh, one and a quarter years on the low end and on the high end, three and three-quarter years to pay a certain sum of, of alimony. True, you know, somebody might say, well, I've only been married five years, why should I pay? But it's an affordable, it should be an affordable sum from the differences of incomes, remember. So we felt that the formula really works. We felt that it's a great starting point, and it may be the end point also. We won't know until it gets into place, until it starts sifting through the system until people get divorced and modifications occur, and we will have to see how the judges are ruling on this. The, the bottom line is they will now have guidelines, and if they want to go outside these guidelines, they have to put in writing why they are doing this and create new case law regarding this. Anything else, Lori, that you want to touch on with this? One thing I would add, Alan, is the importance of these guidelines is that now we have a range. Maybe we don't have an exact number, but I believe a range is going to be highly beneficial because under the current system, we don't know what alimony will be. We don't know how high it will go because the judge has the right to determine reasonableness under the current law. And guidelines will give people more predictability, more certainty, the possibility of being able to resolve their cases or if they don't more certainty of what could possibly happen in court. And for me, you know, as a divorce financial analyst, I'm collaboratively trained. I think that if people know what their ranges would be, if they go to their attorneys and the attorneys are able to figure out what the high end, what the low end would be, and again, yes, judges have the ability to go outside those ranges, but presumably they're going to stay within these guidelines because that's what guidelines are really for. If an attorney can tell their client, look, this is what the low end would be, and I don't this would be the high end. Are you willing to roll the dice and go into court and trying to get, you know, what you want, whether it's the attorney is representing the payer or the receiver, or would you like to sit down with your spouse, so the ex-spouse, and let's try to mediate, let's try to collaborate and come up with a solution without going to court, without litigating. All of this premised on the fact that we're trying to establish less litigation for people. We don't think litigation is the answer, and certainly litigation is what has been happening more frequently over the past, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years even. Um, now we're trying to reverse that and really get less litigation by having durational amounts, by having um, uh, amounts listed for highs and lows for the alimony. Um, that would deal with reduce litigation ultimately. And, and I mean, it really should, in my opinion. What do you think, Lord? Uh, I absolutely agree on that. And I think that's what, one of our goals when we talk about predictability and certainty is to cut out all of the unnecessary litigation that everybody knows all too well and has been through. And I believe the system that you have here, the bill you have, will, will do that. Okay. Alan? So, uh, yeah, sure. yeah, I had a question that came up from one of the uh, viewers. 
uh, this, the bill itself has an effective date of October 1st, 2015. Um, I guess uh, they're asking for a question as to why not July 1st, why is it pushed October 1st, and what would happen to cases that were pending between now and then. I think uh, Lori had some insight on that concerning uh, rulings that may be uh, enacted leading up to that effective date. Do you want to explain that? Yeah, let me, um, let me tell you why the family law section has come out with asking us to wait until October 1st to actually allow this to be law. Typically, you're right. Um, the session ends sometime in, in June after the governor will hopefully would sign this and it would go into effect in, in July, July 1st typically. Um, because this is brand new law, or hopefully will be brand new law, it has to have a certain amount of time to be learned by the judges, by the attorneys. The family section on the floor of all would like to do some education sessions. Um, somebody had spoken to me about even attending some of those sessions and, and, and working with the, some of the, uh, the attorneys, and I'd be happy to do that. But they need some time so that everybody understands it and they can make the appropriate rulings. Um, and that makes sense to us. Have a, you know, three extra a month to understand it and create some seminars about it. I didn't think that would be too much of an issue, and, and we, we agreed to that. Um, Lori, what about that other part that Terry was talking about? How would um, cases that were pending, you think, would be um, ruled? Well, I can't tell you with certainty what judges would do, but it wouldn't make much sense for any case pending and decided between July and October to be decided under a law that's no longer going to be valid. So it would seem to me that somehow or other the new law would have to start applying to current cases as they're being decided, or those cases would have to be deferred to October. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the specific information on that. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I think that certain attorneys would want to be pushing cases to go before judges under the old law and would argue that, that the new law hasn't been in place. And other attorneys would be stalling it and saying, no, we're going to uh, uh, try to stall it until the new law is in place. But again, you don't know what certain judges would do. Talk to your attorney about that and see which is, you know, which is best for you and what they think they would do with, with certain judges. And maybe some of this would happen. We, we get certain answers with the education session from the family section. I, I don't know. Uh, Alan Wilson, at a, at a point of clarification from uh, Laurie, of course, uh, um, concerning the reduction or suspension of alimony while a petition for modification is pending, that actually is in the bill. It's in uh, line 614. And that's, so if you're uh, applying for modification pending something uh, to, to reduce or suspend or eliminate your alimony, um, you have the ability to stop paying it according to the way the bill is phrased right now while that action is pending. That's, that's huge. Right. Of the of the um, many substitute yeah. 614? 614. 614 says any any other fact deemed relevant by the court. I have. So I don't know if, if that's the line that we're talking about. Say again, Lori. No, I, I don't see I don't see that, Terry. It may have been in the original bill, and we'll check on the committee substitute. We still yeah, have to look on. That, that's one we have to look at because that's. That's the most recent. Actually, there's even one more recent than that. And by the way, that that's something, well, when I talk about stakeholders, the legislators recently put back adultery in it, and that was kind of a surprise to everybody, including the family section, um, because adultery, while, you know, it's certainly a, a moralistic and important factor, adultery in a no-fault state is only used insofar as how it has wasted marital assets. Um, by putting adultery in there by itself or, or separate from how it's facing marital assets, what it may be doing is confusing many um, divorcing spouses saying, I want to go back to court because it was an adulterous relationship. And, you know, them going to court litigating, wasting their money, because ultimately judges with case law already that's established have ruled that Adultery is only to be um, looked at if it has wasted marital assets. If no marital assets were wasted, if that cannot be proved, then adultery in and of itself is not something that you want to be litigating. So, am I correct with that, Lori? Um, it, it, the cases are pretty consistent with that, and adultery is not a factor, and 
I think we'd only be speculating on why it was added to the bill. Yeah, well, okay. It's, again, we'll, we'll see where that goes ultimately in the Senate. The bill still has to go through certain committees. It may be modified to a certain extent, and we'll see where that goes. But that's what I was talking about with the stakeholders. You never know what's going to happen, and that's why these are just proposals right now. It's not It's not a, uh, a signed law. Okay, so let's keep on going, Terry. Number four, second spouse's income. Okay. Let's go down to that. There we go. Um, may not ever be used in determining income. That one on the committee substitute, a subsequent spouse's party paying or receiving alimony is inadmissible. I remember when I was on Anderson Cooper, and a current law allowed second spouse's income to be used as considered family income. Now, we have a caveat here, and it's, in my opinion, a legitimate caveat. Um, whether the party claiming his or her income has decreased is diverting income or asset to the subsequent spouse that might otherwise be available for the payment of alimony, then the second spouse's income would be discoverable. That makes sense to me. You know, if somebody is trying to game the system and, and saying, you know, they don't have money to pay alimony, but they're getting money from the second spouse that could be used, you know, for it, and they're diverting their income for other things, then, yeah, I can see that. But as it stands right now, just because you remarry is an alimony payer, it cannot bring your spouse's income in to increase your alimony. That's not going to happen. So that we can get rid of right off the bat. I'm very happy that that is going to make that also. Anything else, Lori, on that? I think you covered it. I think you covered it pretty well, Alan. I know that's been a big concern to people who are in the alimony system and have gone through modifications, and this bill covers it very well, very clearly. Okay. Let's go on to five, Terry. Alimony payers should not be forced back into court to pay more alimony simply because they now earn more money. This was something that bothered me tremendously when I was ordered to pay my alimony. It was a disincentive for me to work harder because I would just have to be fearful that my ex would take me back to court and get more alimony from me because I was making more money. It didn't seem right. It didn't seem appropriate. And sure enough, in our new law, our new proposed law, I should say, um, an increase in an alimony obligor income alone does not constitute a basis for a modification to increase alimony. This, ladies and gentlemen, is also huge because if you are order to pay alimony under a certain duration for a certain percentage of your income, you now have the right, and I would dare say the obligation, to try to make more money and, and earn more without fearing that you're going to be brought back to court and have you to pay more money to your ex-spouse. Make as much as you want. If you have to take a second job, I mean, you know, you do what you need to do to survive nowadays. But make more money in your profession. Make more money in your life. You no longer have to fear having to pay that money for alimony will be set, and you wouldn't have to worry. On the flip side of that, the receiver of the alimony also has an obligation to try to earn money. And, you know, that's just, again, combating the entitlement attitude that so many people have nowadays. So if the receiver of an alimony is making a little bit more money, 10% more we've defined in the proposal. Um, after the divorce has been finalized and time is on, the alimony payer can go back to court to modify their alimony based upon the fact that the receiver is now earning more and doesn't need as much alimony as being paid. Now, of course, with that comes the cost of going back to court. And the alimony payer will have to weigh the odds of the cost of going back to court, what the savings of their alimony might be. So all of that, again, has to be discussed you know, with their attorney um, and, and understand whether or not it's worth doing. Like anything else in life, it's a, it becomes a choice. One of the things that I always, is there anything else, Laura, that you want to, you want to pick up that before I move on to something else? Um, 
Actually, yes, I'd just like to point out something really quick um, and why I think this is such a key provision in, in the bill. What happens a lot of times, if somebody is trying to modify their alimony, they get hit with almost a revenge petition of sorts and upward modification saying, I think you're really making more money and I need more. Not only does this sale prohibit it by saying that an increase in income by the payor is not a modification, there's also a provision in here, if you look at line 618 to 624, which says that if a modification is unreasonably defended or pursued, there's a prevailing party attorney fee clause and there's language that will prevent the person from, who files a modification from receiving fees. And to me, I think both of those go a great length to level the playing field in the current situation. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that part was, was put in by our representative, our own Rich Workman. He did not like the fact that people were gaming the system. And this is a way to say, look, you better be certain when you go back to court that you're deserving of this or that um, you know you don't deserve to have that put on you for real reasons, and and just understand that don't don't fight it. It's something that you know should be to the other person. Um, otherwise, you're going to be hit with those attorney's fees. So I think I think it's really a good way of not making sure people don't gain the system. You're right. Um, okay. One of the other things that was always really important to me is the standard of living costs. Right now, the way that the law is written, and again, it looks good on paper, but practically it doesn't work. And it, what it says is that the, the judges are trying to maintain the standard of living that was had during the marriage in a divorce. We know that that's not practical. We know in today's economy that one income can't pay for two households. What has been happening in current law because of the way it's written is that judges are trying to maintain the same standard of living for one person at the expense of the other person. And I literally had a judge early on in my career doing this say, at least we get it right 50% of the time. And that just, you know, threw me back. I said, this is wrong. So what we've been trying to do all along is to get, and I, again, I was using legal terms because this is what I, the only thing I know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a financial guy, but I wanted a rebuttable presumption that there would be a lower standard of living. We couldn't do that for numerous reasons, and we don't need to do that right now, to be honest with you. Instead, what we were able to get is a clause on page on, on line 269 that says the standard of living of the parties during the marriage with consideration that there will be two households to maintain after the dissolution of the marriage, and that neither party may be able to maintain the same standard of living after the dissolution of the marriage. It's not a rebuttable presumption, but it gives notice to the judges saying, hey, you don't have to order the largest sum of alimony to maintain the same standard of living for one party at the expense of the other. And again, because we have this range, you don't have to order a high end of the range because you're not obligated to maintain the same standard of living. Recognize that there is going to be a, a lower standard of living or that at least neither part may be able to maintain the same standard of living that was had during the marriage. So there's this consideration right now. Not a rebuttable presumption, okay, but a consideration. And again, it's, it's an absolute step in the right direction. And I'm thrilled to have it in there because I think that's, that's also huge. That's going to make a big, big difference in how judges order alimony awards. I've been fighting for that for years, and I'm, I'm proud that we have that in there right now. Um, let's go to number six, and then I'll talk about a few other points that, that I put in my, my notes here. Making a supportive relationship easier to prove in Florida. This is interesting because current law, we talk a lot about cohabitation. And for those people on this call whose spouses are cohabitating with somebody and have been trying to prove that cohabitation, you know how difficult that has been to prove in court. Well, we no longer have to prove cohabitation with this proposed bill. What you have to prove is a substantial supporting relationship, a, I'm sorry, a supporting relationship. And you have to prove that by a preponderance of the evidence. So it's very, very different. Now, again, if you're able to do that, be very careful and make sure that you can do that. Because if you're taking somebody back to court simply because they are cohabitating with somebody, 
doesn't necessarily mean that there's a supportive relationship there. You have to be able to prove a supportive relationship, and that would be a substantial change of circumstance to modify your alimony or eliminate your alimony. That would just give you the ability to go back, but you have to be able to prove that there's a supportive relationship. Um, big, big difference by proving the preponderance of the evidence. If you remember, there were like 11 or 12 different um, items that have to be shown. You know, they're, they're pulling themselves out of spouses, they have bank accounts together, that kind of thing. Um, and a judge could have said, well, you have to prove all 11 or all 12, or another judge could have said you have to prove, you know, one. Now, you just have to prove a preponderance of the evidence and be certain that you can do that, then you might be able to go back and modify everything. But again, be careful because if not, and you're just bringing them back, you might be required to pay their attorney fees if the judge finds that this action is unreasonable on your part. And if the other party, by the way, tries to fight it, even though you have all this proof, and they're fighting it, and the judge deems that they are unreasonable in fighting it, they may have to pay your attorney's fees. So be careful, but a great, great clause with supportive relationships. Anything else on that, Lori? Well, sure, Alan. Uh, to me, I think this is, again, one of the strongest parts of your bill because it's one of the most heavily litigated and most expensive to litigate components. And by eliminating the requirement of cohabitation, that you don't have to prove living together, and also this language uh, that prevents people from unreasonably litigating it, I think we won't see some of the circumstances we've seen where somebody's clearly in a relationship and completely denying the very fact that the relationship exists because right now there's no recourse, there's no penalty to doing that, but under this law, should it take effect in a couple of months, a person would have to think twice about that and would have to think twice about litigating this and perhaps be a little more forthcoming about the relationship and perhaps that would lead to a modification. Although I, I would agree with you on whether the modification would result, what, what the alimony amount would be. I think that is something to take into consideration or look at in terms of your particular case. Exactly. I mean, you have to understand what the ranges are and sit down with your attorney to figure out whether it would be worth going back to court. That's, that's always the case no matter what we're looking at here. Um, yeah, this, this can be this can be used for a lot of people and help a lot of people. One thing I did want to point out, um, you inadvertently said it, and I want, to, I want to be certain that everybody knows, this is not my bill, except your bill. Not my bill. This is a bill worked out with the family law section of real balance, real compromise, with our legislators, but certainly our sponsors effectively, all the co-sponsors, I mean, this bill has, has gone around the world in Tallahassee in every way, shape, and form. Um, so it's everybody's bill, not mine, not theirs, but we all had influence, we all had a part in this. And I, and I gotta tell you, this is really, it might be David and Goliath, you know, going up against the family section, the strongest, most influential, uh, wealthiest lobby group in Tallahassee, but when it's all said and done, you know, they came to us and recognized that certain issues had to be corrected. They recognized that there were certain inequities that were happening, and they want to do what's right by our citizens. Even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't help everybody right now, it's certainly a step in the right direction, and our legislators recognize that. And I'm, I'm so, so grateful for, for that recognition and being able to be a part of all this. I just, I can't tell you how great this is for everybody's sake. Um, I know we've covered a lot. I do want to cover a little bit more because um, I know I've had hundreds of emails and I've tried to answer as many as I could and sometimes I get to them, but I do want to cover a couple of other um, points to this bill that I think is really important. When I, when I say that a judge has a range, a judge can go out of that range. Um, a deviation can occur, but they do have to write down what that deviation is. And that's been on line uh, 315, 316 of, of the proposed uh, the proposed bill right now. So, so you know, they have to write it down, but they can't go out. But guidelines are there for them to use. One of the things that, um, as a financial guy, that's kind of interesting to me, is we have in the bill that, if appropriate, a judge can order alimony to be non 
non-deductible by the payer or non-counted um, on as income by the payee. And that's something that I, I, I my monitor went up when, when I saw it, when I was talking to the family section about it, but I thought that they could not, the state could not um, bypass federal law. In this case, though, there's plenty of case law out there, and it was proven to me that judges, you know, can do that. But what we have in this bill is that the only reason that they should do that or could do that is if it's beneficial to both parties. And, and there might be a reason why. For instance, for instance, if the payer of alimony has so many deductions that the payer doesn't need this deduction, and it would be beneficial to the receiver not to have to pay income tax, on the income, then who does it hurt to have it reversed? It hurts the government, it hurts the IRS. Well, okay, they have enough money as far as I'm concerned. So it would be as long as it's beneficial to the spouses to have that reversal, I'm okay with it. And as long as the judges can do that in our state, which according to state law and case law that I've seen, and I can I can send that out, we can put that out in a uh, one of our newsletters to show everybody I have that case law. Um, I'm okay with it, but the norm should be that alimony is deductible by the payer and declared as income by the by the receiver, and that's what we have in this bill. Um, the last thing that I'm also very proud of that I want to touch on is something that a lot of people have spoken to me about over the years, and that's the life insurance part of, of the bill. Right now, we have people that, that have to um, pay for a, a whole life policy, a, a veritably universal life policy, large sums of life insurance. And then, for whatever reason, either they can't afford to continue to pay the life insurance, or they become uninsurable over time, and the court has still ordered them to have life insurance in case they die, so the receiver gets this you know, tremendous lump sum of money in addition to all of the money that they've gotten over alimony over the years. Well, in this new proposed law, we have since now we have a, a range and we will have a specific end to alimony, a specific end date based upon the duration, we can now have what's called decreasing term life insurance to make sure that the person that has to receive the alimony um, gets you know that in case something happens to the payer. But the decreasing term happens over time and it lowers the amount over time that the payer has to pay until it ends when alimony ends. So it's much more affordable, I guess is what I'm trying to say, than the whole life, than the variable universal life. And um, it's an appropriate way of, of ensuring the payment of the life insurance. And we have that actually in line 371 of the um, committee substitute bill. Um, Terry, you have some other questions? Yeah, uh, there's a couple coming in from some of the viewers. This is uh, probably one for Lori. It was, um, the viewer was looking at the bill and it doesn't say how many years are for short term, mid term, and long term. Uh, can you tell me if this changed? In the past it was seven years for a short term marriage in Florida, mid term between seven and 17, and long term greater than 17. I believe that's gone now, correct? That's absolutely correct, and that was the purpose of this bill. We're no longer uh, classifying alimony, and rather than have medium-length marriages, short marriages, or different forms of alimony, there's basically one one form of alimony, and it would follow guidelines, and it would end at a certain date. That's super. Here, another question was, how much of a reduction in salary would constitute substantial uh, substantial change of income or change in circumstances. There's something in the bill about that too. I, I thought there was. I think there is some percentage on that. No, I know that when a percentage for a reduction, you have to just figure out if you're making less money. If it's substantial enough, if you feel it's substantial enough, go back to court and pay the money for attorney's fees and all of that based upon the guidelines, and you think you could ultimately, you know, have to pay less in alimony to go through all of that, then you're able to go back if you're making less. 
Right, but there's also, if the person receiving alimony is earning more, at least 10% more than the amount imputed to that party, and that's uh, 448 to uh, 452. Right. I, right. I don't know. I don't know if, they were, uh, if the person was talking about the the payor and recipient. Right. I'm not sure. Right. If the if the receiver is making 10 percent more money than was originally imputed, the payer can go back and try to modify their alimony downward based upon the new guidelines. But again. You have to be careful. You have to understand what those ranges may be and what a judge may may order based upon the length of that money that you have to pay. I mean, if it's not permanent, then you may want to really consider what those numbers may be. If it's permanent and it's a high amount and you're still struggling, then, you know, sit down with your attorney and they be absolutely worth your while to try to modify if you know for a fact that the receiver is making more money now. There's a... Uh, uh, Okay. There's one more question, I guess, before we move to the uh, Tallahassee update. Uh, when you say supportive relationship, do you mean like a boyfriend or girlfriend, or could it be a family member or a good friend? Uh, looking at the word relationship and kind of what uh, what does that encompass? Laura, do you want to go through? Okay, I'm, I'm pulling up the language here because I think there were some changes, there were some changes on that. And... Um, one of the desired intent is for the support of the relationship language to include anybody. And I mean, personally, I would like to see if it's a if it's any living person, even if it's a roommate, it's somebody who contributes to the household and reduces expenses. But Alan, um, tell me if people know where it is in bill. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to look. I can't. I can't spot it. Okay, I mean, there's a lot going on in this bill. But you're right. A board of relationship doesn't necessarily have to be um, a family member. It could be anybody that is supporting you. It doesn't have to be in the same household. You just have to be able to prove that there's money coming in from another another relationship of some sort. But I have to again. I can't. I can't find the wording on it right now. We'll look at that. And we'll, we'll get back to that person, Terry. Okay. Ready for the uh, next slide? Sure. Go through it. There's some bacon for you. Oh, there's some bacon. If, if anybody saw the um, the Civil Justice Subcommittee, I actually quoted bacon versus bacon. It's something that um, Representative Rich Workman had quoted back in 2013. And for the first time ever, this was quoted in a staff analysis from the House uh, of Representatives, the bacon versus bacon. And, and again, basically what it just is saying is that Judge Farmer said that um, having total judicial discretion may not be the best course of action for judges. You know, there should be guidelines. There should be, if not outright rules, at least guidelines. And this was done back in 2002, the Court of Appeals. So that's, you know, it's been 13 years, and now we're coming up with these type of guidelines. So very, very happy. And, you know, it took, it took a little while, but we didn't give up, and it looks like this may be happening. If even a staff analysis from the House has, has quoted Judge Palmer at this point. Let's go on to the next slide. And our updates. Um, Valerie Burton, I can't say enough about you know what she's doing, how she how she's holding herself. This is all new to her. She, she learned about alimony in ways that I don't think she ever thought she, she would have. And she's done a fantastic job, and she will continue to do a fantastic job because she believes in these changes. She recognizes what's happening to our citizens, and she's been a, a very intricate part, um, very close part of everything that's happening. And I continue to welcome you know, her, her support, her input, her capabilities, and I can't say enough. Rich Workman, um, well, I say about Rich, you know, he started this at the beginning, he's moved this along, he has taken this under his wing, and, uh, you know, we have him to thank from the very beginning for all this. Um, uh, Senator Stargell also, she's done, you know, phenomenal with all this in the Senate side. She has done this also, she was new to this at one point, she's no longer new to this now. She welcomes us, you know, when we come to see her, she recognizes that we are, you know, the good guys, we're not radical. We want to 
begin to educate her or something new comes up, she's always open to hearing um, some new things that are happening and, and maybe new changes that, that are necessary. And I hope that she remains um, a strong advocate of change um, in these laws in the future as we go through future sessions and may have amendments to, to make in the future. Um, Co-sponsors, they're, they're starting to come out right now, and uh, I foresee many more co-sponsors on both the House and the Senate side. This, um, on, on in, in my area, I think we're going to see some more senators, you know, jump on board. Um, according to to here on the on the website, in that case, that has always been a um, a great proponent of alimony reform right from the very beginning. Eric Eisenago, right, this fellow. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more uh, people in the future. Let's go on one more, Terry. Uh, where are we going next on this? Uh, yeah, we had a 9 to 4 vote in the in the Civil Justice Subcommittee. That's where I spoke up from there on to that. Uh, actually, the House Judiciary Committee is probably not next. We're going to go to the Senate Judiciary. I think that's coming up um, next Thursday or something. I'm not going to be there. Uh, I'm actually going to, uh, to New York on a little mini vacation with my fiance at the, with my mother. Um, who's in a nursing home, and, and it's time for me to see her. So um, I will not be at the Senate Judiciary Committee, but we may have representatives there. And again, we have our lobbyists there, and our sponsors are there, so I'm, I'm perfectly you know, comfortable. I will hear everything. We'll get through everything. I'm not worried about that. Um, and there's the Senate that I was talking about. Um, we, we have the Senate Judiciary coming up. We're going to go to the Appropriations Committee after that. And after we get through all these committees on the House and the Senate side, it's going to go right before Governor Scott will be vetted accordingly and go before Governor Scott for his signature. Uh, questions, comments, what's next? I guess we were dealt with some of that yeah, already. I've got one for you here, Alan. Uh, another question from a viewer. Can current payers take advantage of the right to retire? What about payers who reached a settlement agreement with a new law applied? Um, yes, MSA, as long as the MSA allows for modifications, which means that the MSA cannot state it is non-modifiable. If you have a non-modifiable MSA that's a contract, it means non-modifiable. But if it doesn't say non-modifiable, and simply because you have not modifiable MSAs out there, you can modify your MSA. Um, again, you have to go through the same process. You have to um, have a defined substantial change of circumstance. And once you have that defined substantial change of circumstance, you would be allowed to modify the law. And then you go through that whole process of seeing what the ranges would be, what the amounts would be. Um, talk to your attorney about that. And you'll go before a judge to modify it if you have an MSA. Yes. Am I right with that, Lori? That's absolutely correct, Alan. Right. There's uh, another question, too. Uh, this deals with the age of retirement. Um, you, know, the, you can get uh, some partial uh, Social Security benefits at age 62, but can you clarify the age that retirement is stated in the bill, and also if there's any special exceptions uh, tied in for uh, folks that are in high-risk uh, employment, such as firefighter, EMT, uh, law enforcement, etc. Um, the answer to all of that is yes, and that's why you have that um, declaratory judgment. If you feel that you are entitled to your retirement based upon your age, and you know the the way that you would know that actually is if you're entitled to receive full retirement benefits under the Social Security Act. For one thing, for me. I know it's age 67 right now. I'm going to have to wait for that. Um, other people might be lower. Um, or if you're in a, a profession, like you pointed out, that would be high risk, the retirement age would be lower. And again, you do a, uh, some sort of motion to the, to the uh, courts, the territory judgment that you want to retire in a year. You get the ruling back to say, I'm a firefighter, I'm a police officer, this is the the customary retirement age for our profession, the uh, court should come back and say, yeah, you know, 
But be careful with those type of professions also because, again, if you're going to court to try to modify, a judge might say, well, you're young and might make the alimony amount more geared on the higher end, you know, for duration potentially, or the higher end toward um, amounts potentially, um, because you are a younger age. That's a possibility. I'm not saying that will happen, but again, just know all of all situations that may occur in time. So one more good, here's a good question to you. Before, before, is that correct? Before I before we go on, Terry, I'll make sure that I I can speak out of turn here. Okay, uh, yeah, real real quick, yes, Ellen, that is that is absolutely correct. The bill does address the language of customary retirement age and it also talks about in a modification that the court will consider the age of the parties, the, their health, the assets, and ability to maintain part-time or full-time employment, which is something that anybody in a high-risk profession may have a customary uh, retirement age that's below federal retirement age should look at whether they are going to continue to work in, in some capacity or another, because that is a question that will arise. Right. Uh, okay. Some uh, some websites are indicating that since Massachusetts changed their law a few years ago, judges are still not completely following it. Um, can and will that happen in Florida, and what can be done to kind of protect against that happening? There is a big difference between what the legislature intends and the intent and what may be interpreted in the court system. Um, what I'm hopeful for is that the intent of the legislature is how and what the courts interpret. We're not going to know until it gets into the courts. But because we have a family section, again, as a compromise, they, they agree to this, they want this, um, we would hope that the courts interpret it as the legislators have intended. Um, that said, the Massachusetts bill, and, and this is something that I just you know, kind of want to touch upon, I'm sorry that it happened, I really am, because they have retroactivity in it, and on appeal, the retroactivity was, was taken away, was reversed. I know Steve Hitner and some of the people up there are trying to work um, within the courts to try to get some of that back somehow, but our bill was vetoed back in 2013 based upon the retroactive um, facets of it, and had it not been vetoed, it may have been vetted for the courts just like Massachusetts were on appeal, and then all that rescinded too. So I don't know, you know, what's better if we if we was voted on and, and passed in 2013 just to be taken away on appeal or vetoed and allowed us to come up with this new type of law that we feel is is much more appropriate, um, much more um, practical and oriented and has the approval of all the stakeholders involved so that we don't have appellate issues going forward. And that's what I'm really hopeful for. Excellent. Uh any other uh, questions or comments uh, on this as we head down the home stretch? Home stretch it is. In there? Okay. We can home going here. Here we go. What everybody do at this point? Um, we're at the point where you can begin contacting members of the House and Senate committees. Uh, we know the the committee members, um, our newsletter will be sending out, um, it will list the, the committees that the bill is going to be going in front of and it will list the committee members. We ask you to email them, you can go online, let them hear your voice. This has been what has helped us all along with our membership. You know, the governor asked us, um, I should say the governor asked us, but the governor's uh, representative um, back when his chief of staff asked us to create an alimony army. And, and literally, that's what we've done. We, we have so many people that are behind us. Uh, the media has been behind us, has been reporting very effectively, very correctly, and has been educating um, uh, people all on both sides, you know, mind you. But we as an organization, we want it to go in a certain capacity, in a certain way, and we have to have our voices strong. Our legislators want to hear from us. This is why we put them in office. This is why they are there. They are there to serve the people. But the people have to tell them what they want. The people have to say, this is what we demand. As citizens of the state of Florida, this is what we want. We are your constituents. We put you in office. And by the way, if we don't get what we want, if, we, if you're not listening to us, you don't deserve to be in office. We will remove you from 
of office the next time we have to vote. On the other hand, if you do what we're asking, and if you do the right thing, and you're creating balanced law, and it's beneficially affecting us, we want you to stay there forever. We want you to go on. We want you to become more in politics. You know, politics are a big part, a huge part, of what all this was about. I, I, believe me, I've learned more about politics than I ever wanted to know. I'm not political. I don't want to run for office. I want our politicians to do the right thing, and I'd love you know, to be part of the system and see democracy in progress. So please write them. Please call them. Come to the Tallahassee meetings. You may not be able to speak, and I think they, they put Tallahassee so far up there so that most people don't make the trip. Um, God knows I've made it often enough on those roads. Um, but if you go there, see democracy in progress. When the bill is being signed, when, when, I'm sorry, when it's being voted on in the Senate, in the entire Senate, or the entire House. I would love to see my members fill the, um, it's not called the stadium, Terry, what is it called up there? The chamber? Okay, the, the, no, up on the top, where everybody, on the full uh, house. The, the, the gallery, up in the gallery. Yeah, gallery, the gallery. I would love to see our members fill that gallery and cheer when this bill is voted on by the House and the Senate and it passes. That, that feeling is it, like a, I don't know what to. I don't know how to explain it. It's like seeing your your team winning in a big stadium. It's incredible. So be involved. Get involved. That's how we've effectively and been effective over the years. Um, go to our website, FamilyLawReformUSA.com. You'll find information on there. We're always updating that. We have our contact information on there. Um, donate. Donate. I had a gentleman come to my office today who I know is a permanent down money payer, and he pulled up money, he gave me an envelope, said, this is family law reform, and I'll send it to Chuck, I don't even know how much it is, I haven't even opened it yet. Um, we need the donation. The only way that we were able to get in front of our legislators, the only way we could get out to Tallahassee, the only way we could afford our lobbyists, a public relations firm, the internet that we have, unfortunately, it's all you know related to getting income. I'm sorry, that's just the way it works. I wish I could do this without income, I wish I can just, you know, do all of this without having to spend any money. That's not the way our society works. You know, to get in front of our legislators, we have to be able to help maybe fund their campaigns a little bit so they can wait that they're doing right by us. We want to do that. We want them to know that we're supportive of their efforts and this is the way politics work. So we need those donations, you know, to continue on. And to be perfectly honest, when we get this new law passed, I don't want to be a victim of our own success. There's much, many other areas of family law that we want to be able to beneficially affect for our citizens. You know, we have military people out there that are paying out along on top of, of the military judgments, you know, for their, uh, for their pension plans. We have child support issues, you know, that are out there. Um, people. This is just, you know, a pet peeve of mine, and I hope family leaders, family law, um, sexual leaders are listening right now. Um, with child support, if you go into arrears, they take away your license, your professional license, your driver's license. So how can you go to a job if you don't have your license uh, and, and create more money so you go into more arrears and ultimately they throw you in jail? Well, how are you going to pay child support in jail? What if there were a way to do community service and get paid and put the paid money for the community service for your child support arrears and work out some sort of negotiation that way instead of having going to, to jail. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know if that's going to you know, ever materialize, but it's an idea. And, and it's an idea that can incorporate important change in our society for family law. That's why we need Family Law Reform USA. That's why we need your donations to make sure that we don't go away make sure that we're not a victim of our own success even when we get this new law. Because there will be amendments that have to be done. We will have to tweak it. I want a way for us to learn the data, to, to accept the data. I want the state to um, create some sort of, of committee or a board to gather data and be able to report if what we're doing right now is successful. And if it's not, we need to tweak it, but we need to know the data, we need to understand what that is. So, ladies and gentlemen, there's so much more that needs to be done. 
There's so much more that we can do to really help our citizens, to help our families, to help our children, to do what's right. I'm going to just end, you know, how I started, and, and that's just to say, how do you eat an elephant? And it's really one bite at a time, but we have to continue fighting. We have to continue eating away. We have to continue and not ever let up. Um, we're all in this together. With your assistance, we will be successful. Thank you for your time, your support, your commitment, and I guess just everything. I, you know, I couldn't do this myself. No one person can. Without your help, without your support and guidance, none of this would have happened. Um, so, thank you. Lori, do you have anything else you want to mention before we finish this? No, just thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thanks for all the great questions and looking forward to watching this go forward. And Terry, we know that this is a recording. If people want to have it, they'll be able to, if they get it, they'll be able to tune in. Uh, that's correct. A copy of the webcast uh, should be on the website uh, maybe as early as later this evening, but certainly by some time tomorrow. Uh, we didn't get to all the questions, but if uh, there's something we missed, uh, info at FamilyLawReformUSA.com will get right to us, and someone will respond back to you. Uh, again, if there are questions concerning your individual plan, we really, individual case, we really can't help you much on it because we can't give legal advice. We always suggest you talk with your attorney or qualified legal representation. But of a general nature, uh, we definitely should be able to assist. And also keep in mind, as Alan mentioned, that this is the bill. The bill will change. We'll see a few more amendments. It's going to be a little bit different, hopefully, uh, more likely than what you see currently. But hopefully the amendments will be all for the better, and we'll have a successful conclusion in Tallahassee sometime uh, later next month. I look forward to having another webinar when the bill is signed into law to really explain you know, some of the specifics. And uh, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for your continued financial support. I appreciate it, and, and that's the way we move forward. Great. Have a great Thank you, Alan and Lori. And again, this concludes the webcast. Uh, again, a copy of it will be on the website. Thank you very much, and have a great evening.